difference. I think if, if you end up like um, really trying to analyze what art is on like a philosophical level, I think you really just end up with it's the stuff that people make. Mm -hmm. and, um, you're going to find really interesting things that people made tons of and just thought of as garbage and you can still learn lots of things from those mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. So I like it. Yeah. yeah. I think as a Christian too, I, there's this, there has to be a sense in which what we make and what we do has significance. It, it matters because it's part of who we're, you know, what we were created to be, which I think the idea of the separation between craft on one hand or utilitarian kinds of things, craftsmanship, utilitarian, as opposed to fine art or high art, while there's like a spectrum to separate that so distinctly for me, I think has, has done a disservice to what's considered high art or fine art to say that it's, um, to push it to this extreme where it's become like it is necessarily useless. Ah. And not valuing that art does something, art has a function. We as artists have a responsibility to make and that that has an impact on other people and the world around us. And I, I, I'm not a big fan at this point of art for art's sake, not, which is, there's a, for me, there's a very, very wide chasm before you go to the sense of trying to like propaganda, but you know, their self-expression is, is valuable. But anyway, just that that's, that's interesting when you're talking about those things that makes me like it even more. <laughs> I just kind of, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I was just going to say that I, I liked the, um, the, the, the active, um, activeness, I guess, of the, um, of the word maker and, and to make, because I think the spiritual walk can, uh, can be presented a lot of times, especially in, in churches as, as as receiving a lot, receive, 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 which is only, which is true, but um, I don't know. I, I guess I just I don't. Know, I, I guess I kind of associate it like maker with kind of a more earthy quality about it versus like mm -hmm. I don't know. But that just yeah. 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 <laughs> but you were saying, Karen? Sorry. Oh, um, the. I'm there's there's you I thought about tool makers like a tool maker is a maker too a house a guy who constructs a house is a maker and I think when I used to be a designer I for a little short while I was not a good one but I did do it I mean well I guess I was okay at it but um but I used to say that like, and I was a courtroom illustrator for a while and, um, oh gosh, I can't think of his name, but that brilliant, there was a very, very good courtroom illustrator who did gorgeous sculptures as studies of the figures he was gonna work on, Daumier. And he also did other art and his courtroom illustrations are good enough to be art. So I think that there's this beauty, there's this effort where a quilt becomes beautiful. And there's the effort where a quilt is a quilt. And I think it's this place that's only in the energy and the force and the anointing maybe on it that that makes it transform into that that other thing. And I do think that, I mean, one of the things that I treasure is the lady who pours the oil on Jesus and that Judas snapped at that point. I say this a lot, 
around here. That was actually when he separated from Jesus, when Jesus did not rebuke her for wasting all that oil. And what she did was she introduced beauty into the room through the scent. And I call that non-utilitarian beauty. So, and Jesus praised her for it and said she'd always be remembered for this choice. Now, it's non-utilitarian beauty, but it glorified Jesus. So there is utility there. You know, there is exactly. something happening there, but it's not, um, it's not a pot, you know, it's not a, and that pot, as I said, can be in that transformative place. It, it can be glorious. And um, I've, I've often thought that man shows up not where you see tools, man shows up where you see art in archeology. span I mean, animals can use tools, but the art making is a man thing. So, and the other thing I wanted to throw out while we're throwing around, playing around with the word making, because I'm, I know I'm jumping all over the map, but I got really thrilled by something Mako said. He quotes, faith without works is dead. And if I'm right with my poor memory, that he says that word works is the word that's also used for making. Mm -hmm. And when you read it, faith without making is dead. To me, that makes so much sense in this broad sense that we're evidence, we ourselves and what we make is evidence of Jesus existence if we're the Holy Spirit's in us and that output is putting a different flavor, a different je ne sais quoi in what we do because we have this screen, this living thing in us that is willing and working to God's good pleasure. So, so I love this faith without making is dead because our making can be very broad. It can be comforting someone because it's transformative. When that someone changes, it's transformative. So I'll, that's, I'll stop talking now for a minute, for a few. Sorry, I was, you know, I throw so many different topics out. But. No, that's great. I'm gonna read a little bit of the section you're talking about. So those that haven't read it yet will know. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. And he's talking about God is not just restoring us to Eden. This is on page 12. God is creating through us a garden, an abundant city of God's kingdom. What we build, design, and depict on this side of eternity matters because in some mysterious way, those creations will become part of the future city of God. And, um, and Jesus's love extends beyond utilitarian need to survive or our pragmatic need for a savior. Jesus's tears for us, he's talking about in the garden are uh, gratuitous, extravagant, and costly. So I'm just throwing a couple things in there, but this is where you were talking about Karen the Greek word poyo, which I'm sure that's not how you say it, to make or to, to do, and it's related words poima, that which has been made or done, and poietes, a maker or a doer, appear more than 3,200 times in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures, and more, more than 80 times in the New Testament. Note the significance of these words, which have to do with making. Some translators translate poe as to do, as in doers of the word, which reduces its generative possibilities and focuses on a rather industrial sense of the word. Part of the theology of making is to bring full color to these words, which are often interpreted in a narrower sense. It's not wrong to translate it as to do or doer, but the emphasis on the maker will necessitate revisiting these passages to give it its full significance. So I, I think it's it's also very close to uh, this, it's the same root words for poetry, poetics. It's the same kind of thing. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting too. 
and it does shift it sh for me it really does i th he also he he in there at some point kind of is like you know what if the the whole book of the Bible, you know the whole bible is is really an artistic book you know is better understood in a poetic form and it, it seems to me there's a lot more grace in some of the difficult passages. Um, like even what you're saying, faith without works is dead. What do we mean by works as opposed to without making, without creating, without participating? Um, that changes things for me a lot. So I just had a thought. Um, I've recently been listening to a series from Israel from a Messianic Jew, and he's interpreting, he's giving us the real interpretation of the words, because so often what we read in our Bibles, the Hebrew or the Greek word is not really what it really is in the native language. So I was just wondering if when Jesus bent down and wrote in the dirt, I wonder if he drew in the dirt, and I wonder if he drew a picture for all those men that were trying to stone the woman and what kind of picture he might have drawn. Yeah. What do you imagine it was, Anita? Well, I, th this just flashed on me, Lisa, when you were talking to so. Zoe. <laughs> it wasn't pornography. That much I do know. That was the first thing that popped in my head is he like. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I heard is that it's demonstrating that he understands the law at least as well or better than they do because uh, writing in the sand was okay on the mm. Sabbath, but oh, writing with a pen on paper was not. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> it's sort of a, a little illustration he gave them that I know what you're doing. And I know these rules. Yeah. Um, what what he wrote, people <laughs> <That's> hear. <okay. laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Oh, I liked the um, building together idea that was at the beginning of the section you read. Mm. We're building the city of God. Is that yes? Sort of the idea? Yes. Um, that reminds me of something I shared with one of our earlier groups with Cheryl. Like, that was a long time ago. Way back when. It was yeah. like a year, almost a year ago. I know. A long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's the story I shared of when I was a kid, I was thinking, well, what are, what are the adults all doing when they're not home? And it's like, oh, they're teaching me about things like sharing and stuff. So they must all be really good at this sharing thing. So they must all be working on something together that's really important. Something like this magnificent, like, castle space city thing they must be making something that's really important and then i found out that they're just not really doing anything important <laughs> everybody's just trying to get their their bread i guess <laughs> but i mean that is it. i think it is transformative to think about our work as the church and do like it what if we were really focused on building that together, not a literal city, but like, and the, this is where, like, I, where he's talking about this, what we make in now matters, has eternal significance. N.T. Wright, who did the foreword to the book, talks a lot about, well, that's basically what his book is about, um, Surprised by Hope. And it was fascinating reading that book because he's taking He's talking about, you know, uh, heaven, new heaven and new earth, what happens after death, this kind of stuff. And it sounds almost shocking to hear some of what he's talking about, um, but it's, but he's quoting the Bible, <laughs> you know, like it's not shocking. It's actually what the Bible says. And I, just the focus on um, what the focus on simply, you know, trying to basically survive this life in order to you know go to heaven and forget everything here what that robs us of in in our in our lives and i i think this 
is really important for artists. I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, how do you get to the place where it matters whether or not you make art? Like if it's not utilitarian that it doesn't like, it's not this cup that, you know, I can drink out of. And you're a, a Christian, I don't know. I, I, I feel like it starts to really matter whether or not it, it accomplishes something on a spiritual level or on a, on a more, on an eternal level. Does that, does that resonate in any way? I, I just want to throw in, it's relationship, right? It, yeah. It's not about doing the law right. It's about hanging with this person you know. It's about connection. So when the art is part of the connection, that alone is sufficient because you're in the sandbox together. You're playing or working. Sometimes art is playing and sometimes it's working. But that energy that it matters, it's, I, it's like while the piece is still being built, it's very important. After it's built, it's not as important. Mm -hmm. It's important because you're not you're doing it with him mm -hmm. somehow he's present and that is sufficient does does that mean because he's about relationship but that product of the relationship is the evidence of his existence on earth mm. so my product, if I'm a psychologist, the product of my relationship mm -hmm. is the comfort I give to people. And that transformative thing. But I think we're always transforming. Yeah. And it's through that relationship with him. I'm just throwing that one out to you. No, I love that. I love that way of thinking that the, the product is the evidence of that relationship. That, that makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the art is the perfume. Yeah. Exactly, I agree 100%. And, and it could have been given for, for to the bread for the poor. I mean, you know, I. And we're still running into Judas. We are. We're always running into Judas. Like, there's. I. I don't want to like tell on somebody, but how do I <laughs> tell the story without telling? There's a gallery I was associated with that was a Christian gallery, and they had all these real energetic artists, and they ended up putting them into missionary work and running the gallery, and they weren't making art. They were doing the thing Judas would have them do, you know, feeding the poor and doing the thing and doing the thing. But the art making, they were kind of sidetracked. All that energy was sidetracked. And the, the non-utilitarian fragrance of the performance of the relationship mm. is is the is was worthy according to jesus and that's what we have to hold on to when we're doing these things because some of the evidence is very similar to the psychologist when a person sings and brings the audience to tears because it's evanescent it's gone but something happened in people's hearts when the actor blows your head off, you know? So it's not just making, it's that other kind of making. Yeah. And I think it's so, I think these conversations are really important because in my experience, I feel like 
so many artists who are Christians or Christians who would be artists have internalized Judas. Like we have an internal Judas so much that because how do you, I mean, I, I certainly have struggled with that at Convergence. I don't, I still don't know how to answer the question, you know, why are you doing a fundraiser to support the artists at Convergence? Why don't you do a fundraiser to give money to feed people? Or, you know, let's, we need to do something that's going to be really helpful is, is the underlying thing there. And that's from people who, who are very, very supportive and maybe even artists themselves. And yeah, it is it is a reshaping of the way you see the what is happening in that making or in that pouring of the perfume. And there are other parts of the body that are hungry other than just the stomach. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. And I think, I mean, they need that food. I have food you know not of. Yeah. Right. Even a secular artist can give that food. Yeah. And Mako says something in his, but he's, he was describing his art making process and that flying and everything. And he said, you know, oftentimes uh, secular artists understand this better than Christians. And I, I think that's I think that's really true. I feel like there's some of this that you talk about with a non-Christian and they totally get it. But Judas has gotten into our heads as Christians. Hmm. I, I have another story and I'll try to another ang, you know, kind of irritated Judas story. I, I was at a and I might have told this one before. I know a couple of you may have heard it, but I was at this church that was very evangelical and they had this night it was an arts night so i lugged like a couple of my sculptures in and i you know jesus is great you know they're actually looking at art and oh wow and this person had put these painting little watercolors they painted in like one afternoon like four five like there was a number and they were very um raw pieces to put it you know and um and their stuff was right next to mine and i was staying decently away and but i couldn't help but notice that there were all these people pulling around the area where my work was and i was really excited that the evangelicals were getting maybe my work and when i got over there I realized that she had put the these watercolors up and then she had put all these pictures of her mission poorly photographed pictures of the mission she went on um like a year ago or whatever it was and she needed more money for the next mission she was going on and the people were pulling around these bad photographs at this art meeting because they could get the mission mm -hmm. right and the art was a hook to let her be allowed to be there and she was getting more attention than any artist mm. because she was doing what they got the judas thing right right and by, and i don't mean to say it's not right it's all right right but we have to know what we're called to mm -hmm. and we have to be comfortable with it Mm -hmm. And you can't let that Judas frustration get us confused because yeah. Jesus said it's okay. In fact, it's good. And he also talks about Bazeal or whatever the heck his name is, Bazeal or whatever. Yeah, Bazeal, yeah. Yeah. And, and he talks about that as being the first person talked to, spoken of as being um, filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes an artist yes and that makes so much sense because even a non-christian artist can fly mm -hmm. and i think that's god's mercy and his activity in our souls yeah yeah 
And it's part of the creation witnessing. The creation witnesses tells about God. Is it possible that creating tells about God? Well, we are part of the creation, right? So it would make sense that, you know, that's part of our outpouring. That's the, that should be what comes out of us. Yeah. It, it is one of our, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll be quiet for a minute. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm thinking though, you know, and I know that this is a big thing for you, Karen, about helping uh, about young artists being able to kind of get to that place of freedom and understanding. And, and I'm just, as we're talking about this, I'm thinking, you know, I, I really, I, I got excited when, when Mako released Culture Care, because I, I felt like, oh, good, somebody wrote that book. And the pastors are going to read that and I don't have to worry about like that part of things they'll so I can just focus with the artists, but I, I mean I, I think there is, I don't know I'm just that we as artists have got to get comfortable with it, like you said. Um, it, there is maybe some maybe that's part of the growth that needs to happen um, now is for artists to own and understand that call and stand up for ourselves and stop waiting to be approved of or given permission but to, to say you know this the here are the places in the bible and here's how i know and this is what i've been called to and you know i speak with authority because it is there in the bible and the best love story is an incredible story about authority um, which I'm doing a Bible study on, and we're going to be doing a uh, um, online spiritual collective starting in February. Um, but that's, I mean, it's it's pretty cool because Moses actually get, I mean, God gives Moses all the instructions to build the temple, but Moses doesn't give it to Bezalel. Bezalel, like there, he doesn't give Moses doesn't give the details, doesn't give all the information to Bezalel, but Bezalel is given the ability to be able to do it, and God. You know, Moses is an administrator, but he couldn't administrate that. God chooses an artist to do an artist's job. He chooses an administrator to do an administrator's job, you know? So it's, yeah, we, I think we do need to get to a place where we have a sense of authority in our, uh, in our area of what, what we're called to do. Well, and this may be a perfect time to do it with Zoom and with various way, ways that different arts can incorporate what they're doing with, with a larger group of the church and people who might not normally want to interact in that way. They might be enticed because how else are they going to interact? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Joanna, what about you? What else has kind of been resonating with you? Um, let me see. I guess it, it's interesting because um, several years ago, I, I I remember going to a small group retreat and um, and I was reading this book. I think it was, I haven't read it since, but it was, I think it was For the Beauty of the Church, I think. Um, and sorry, That's and, okay. <laughs> okay, you're like, um, uh, I'll get back oh, in a second. <laughs> sure, no problem. <laughs> what about you, Kate? What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about anything? <laughs> Uh, I'm always thinking about something. I, I, what I'm thinking is, yeah, I really want to get this, these books and dig into them more. Um, what am I thinking? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about that ownership and um, as in taking, taking 
um, just that unapologetic, unfearful, unintimidated. Well, I mean, like all those things might be at play, but just taking ownership of, you know, God's call in my life and um, just uh, you know, kind of as a, maybe even as a spiritual discipline, <laughs> releasing that imposter, that sense of disqualification or imposter or, you know, like, um, I mean, there's that that's just kind of a human, you know, condition or whatever to wade through. But then there's also just kind of that in the form that, you know, like all of you guys, I, I know I've experienced in, in the, ch you know, in the church where it's just not quite, um, either it's, you know, this frivolous uh, thing or, um, it's a worldly thing, you know, worldly thing. Mm -hmm. no, anyway, you probably know what I'm, Mm -hmm. yeah but, yeah mm -hmm. reclaiming my pearls <laughs> yeah. <is> call it. <laughs> from the swine i might yeah. say <laughs> yeah that's in print the title of the book is reclaiming my pearls and, and then in parentheses from the swine <laughs> You know, there's a book by Frankie Schaefer, Pearls Before Swine, about art. Oh, interesting. It's, he went off the rails, according to some, when he did a nasty little tell-all about his parents. But he, he wrote this very good book, um, Pearls Before Swine, that really made an impact on me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kate, I'm sorry to nag you about this, but ever since I saw that collage you built, I, you, you can speak with visuals, things that need to be said mm -hmm. with great heart and power. I have no doubt in my mind of your calling after seeing your work. Thank you. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Mute. <laughs> oh, man. Joanna, you're back. Yeah, I might need to move actually because the cartoons are kind of loud in the other room. But um, <laughs> um, let me see. I guess it's interesting because I. I guess for, for me, um, I feel like a, a lot of my creative work has been kind of done in secret, I guess. Um, you know, if, as a performer, you're, you're kind of limited by, by, what, um, by what opportunities are available. And so, but at the same time that the, that voice that 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 desire to create hasn't gone away um and which is why i i guess i kind of looked in sort of the photography and and, and writing and you know and, and i have you know poems in my drawer and and yeah. and photographs online that i i don't share with anyone <laughs> i mean they're they're on public but i just don't you know i'm like yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> um but at the same time, um, I do them with the idea that, you know, even if if no one sees them, it's, it's God who sees them. And so mm. I guess in a way it's sort of still cultivating that, that relationship as kind of as Kieran had mentioned before, just the idea that, um, you know, who is my audience? Um, you know, ultimately, you know, for me, at least, you know, God is my audience. And so, you know, what, 
you know, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and it's interesting because what I was had started to say was um, several years ago, I was, um, I was busy with a job that I didn't have time to do really any art. Um, I actually still don't really have time, but, <laughs> but even more so then, I guess. And, um, and I was reading this one book, which is before the beauty of the church. And, and I felt like, I wish I could remember what it, what the passage was exactly, but I, I felt like through that book that that God was affirming to my spirit that even though I'm not actively making, it doesn't mean that I'm not an artist, I guess, or that I'm like, you know, I think on one hand, you do have that um, imperative to make, but at the other hand, it's, it's also, um, uh, I don't know. I, I guess it's, you know, it's that fine line between, you know, uh, being a child of God and making and, and versus like, you know, getting caught up in, in works, I guess. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so I, so that's, those are my thoughts. And uh, I actually, I did, um, I did read it further, but I, 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 I didn't finish the book either, but there's, there's a, a lot of good stuff. Um, and even though it's 150 pages, it's really dense, <laughs> which is a good, but it's a, there's just like a lot <laughs> to talk about. So anyway. Um, yeah. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. And I just want to bring up this tension and it is, I don't know if I'm the only one, but artists who aren't making, there's this guilt trip mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, we're taught, we're caught between Judas and the guilt trip that you're not making. And it's like, it's perfect. You know, the enemy is the accuser. And if he keeps you in the middle in misery on either side, it's perfect. He's got you in the sweet spot. So we, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus because there are seasons in our lives. And, there, and it is about the relationship. It's about the things you do together. I mean, I have this really revolting picture of, I mean, to a, to a prudish person that when he talks about the, the marriage of the lamb, that even these, it's almost like he is the one who brings life to our art. And if we're not, that he's the one who takes us to the places we wouldn't be by ourselves mm -hmm. as artists. And like Michael Andrew talks about the angels helping him, you know, find his way through David. Um, so this, this is almost like a marriage. This is almost like an egg and a sperm. This is almost like a fertilization. Mm -hmm. This relationship of this living God with our lives and the product that gets created. I, and that evidence of this marriage of the lamb, it's not just in heaven. Yeah. It's wherever heaven comes to earth. It's wherever man and God have an exchange. And in art, I think that that exchange is legitimate. Yeah, I think this idea of seasons is very, very important. And also that matched with the idea of eternal significance that we, you know, you know, there's more because you know, if you, if you look at things on, a, like there's a, Jay has a, a, a book that he has in his mind, a story, but one, like there's a, a group of people, a nation of people who basically are seen as children until they reach their forties. It's only when they're in their forties that they start to become like teenagers. And I think about that a lot. Cause I feel like in a way that's kind of true. <laughs> you know, that's really true. These people live for hundreds and hundreds of years but I think it's kind of true for us too. And I think embracing seasons, especially as a mother um, is an important, really important thing and understanding the way that I think there's so much about being called as an artist that has to do with being shaped as a person and that affects what you're able to create. Um, and there is a maturity that's happening always. You know, that's why you're, you're constantly 
drawing or just, you know, journaling or whatever, you know, you're, you're doing the things that you need to do to kind of stay in touch with your craft, but there's also personal and spiritual development that allow that I think God is working in us to make us able to do, you know, whatever the next thing is. And, you know, sometimes being the, bringing that creativity and that artistry to being a mom or being a, a wife or being, you know, a coworker or being a, you know, grandmother or whatever is, I, I think it, it, it's just like coming back to this, this pouring of the oil. Sometimes the art is the interaction is the, is the pouring of the, like, I think if you, if you expand out and you can probably appreciate this, Joanne, as a performer, I think a lot about performance artists and like you can expand that definition out to the point where it's sort of like living your daily life can be an artistic experience just kind of depends on the intentionality that you bring with it um so i have i i have the theory that the modern woman curates her home and makes her home beautiful. And this is her artistic expression during certain seasons in her life. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a beautiful thing and it's a worthy thing. Mm. I couldn't help but see some really beautiful colors and and things happening in the room around you, Joanne. And it, it is this season. I mean, I have to tell you, I went to art school and I painted and I did this and I did that, but I started really producing. Uh, in the cusp between 30 and the late 30s and 40s. I started producing adult work. I started producing work that that God was inhabiting. Even though I'd known God since I was 33. But I wasn't, it's like you have to percolate. Mm -hmm. And there are seasons where you, I did, I did produce decent stuff in those other years, but he, you know, he's, he will, he wills and works to, you know, what is it? The works in us to will and work to his good pleasure, but he also, we are his workmanship. We yeah. are his poetry and we have to be patient with him in these seasons. And the glory of good parenting <laughs> and the importance of the product of good parenting is the living, that's the living glory, you know? That's good. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I really like your idea of life as a performance. Mm -hmm. And if I thought of my interacting with other people as a performance, I might do a whole lot better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a whole, I have a whole other, because performance is so much, so often derided as being false or lying, when in reality, it's all about truth telling. It's about really being able to be present and truthful. So, yeah. Can I add one more thing to that idea, um, which is, I feel like maybe because it's a more contemporary um, art movement is process art. Mm -hmm. um, I really, like that's really a part of my work. Um, often feeling like the process is more important than the product. I mean, sometimes that can be a little bit of a overstated sometimes. I think the end product can be important, but I think too often in this particular culture that we're in, where the the product is supposed to be like propaganda or something, <laughs> like mm -hmm. the, the end product is supposed to really have this functional thing that it does. I think that really diminishes um, the process part of it too, uh, especially for people who um, are less uh, lingual, as in like they are less of a verbal processing person and they may need to knit or they may need to 
draw or sketch in order to work through things with God. Like mm -hmm. that, like I've really felt like my drawing time is a prayer time. And that doesn't necessarily mean that like at the end I've got like the, the words of God are drawn on this page. That's not really what's mm -hmm. going on. Like how could I sell that? That'd be kind of strange. <laughs> like, um, but I have felt like, I don't know if Mako has gone into that too much in his, but it has been some of what we've talked about in terms of um, spiritual disciplines. Um, and I feel like maybe people who are more on the writing uh, end of the arts maybe understand some of those things better. But you, because they're, they're closer to the verbal processing person who's talking through what it is, uh, like talking through that prayer. Mm -hmm. um, but someone who is less verbal, maybe I feel like our culture won't get that quite as much. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's really important um, for opening up more people to have a deeper, more authentic relationship with God. Because I, I feel like if I was stripped of all my sketchbooks and every drawing, like, and every piece of writing I've ever had, the, my, the depth of my faith would be so much more shallow. If all it was was, like, me going to church and having some conversation and some quiet prayer time, I feel like I have a much more shallow um, relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah, this opens up so many conversations. I'm thinking uh, as as an actor, you know, we're in a we're in a, a funny place because we're almost more in that craftsman category because we don't write it, uh, you know, envision it. We embody something that somebody else has created, and and it, it's completely ephemeral. You know, especially if you're talking about theater, theater, live theater, once it's done, it's done. There is no like, you know, here's my body of work. Um, and so there's something very, I mean, it, the whole thing hinges on being present in the moment. That's all acting training is, is really about is, is that being present. And I just, as you're talking about that processing thing, I'm correlating that with memorization of I, I just that used to be in the ancient church you know you had memorizing the scriptures and then singing it and I wonder how much we've lost by not incorporating that because there's something that happens there's a level of chewing on things when you have to memorize it that just does not happen otherwise it allows you to internalize it in a completely different way. Well, we also had these deep, long traditions of scripture copying. Yeah. Um, which are, it's in some ways like a, what influenced my work, just mm. seeing that, oh, this used to be a thing that a lot of Christians were a part of and it was part of their training in scripture but it was also part of like the, the lineage um, because without their work, we wouldn't have the text mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 211. So I'm going to, I'm going to cut us off, but I, I, this has been a great conversation. I feel like I've been wanting to have these conversations for a while. So thank you, Joanna, for um, taking the initiative to get us going. Oh. Thank you for, for, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Zoom and everything else. So. Thank no you. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to do the, um, the conversation next Friday with uh, Trinity Forum at 1.30 with Mako. Um, I'm not doing, I will be present. Um, but then after that, the next Friday, if you guys are, I'll, I'll keep sending out links, but if you're around next Friday, I'd love to continue the conversation you know, however much further you get or not in the book. This is just a really rich conversation for me. Um, it seems like it's encouraging for all of us. So we'll keep on, keep it up. 
Okay. Yeah, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Lisa. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank everybody. Yeah. Thanks for your insights. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.